Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fourth COVID-19 by risk professionals for risk professionals conference call. I'm Jonathan Price, the Dallas-Fort Worth RIMS 2020 chapter president. This call is brought to you in partnership with the Dallas-Fort Worth RIMS chapter, Chicago, and LA RIMS chapters. If there's a topic you'd like for us to obtain speakers, please visit dfwrims.org and click on our COVID-19 page to submit a question or submit your interest in joining our panel. We are joined today by Jeff Stoley, the Director of Risk Management at Castle and Cook and the LA RIMS 2020 Chapter President. Thanks, Jeff, for being on the call today. Thank you, Jonathan. I think these calls are a great idea and benefit to our members. I commend you and the DFW RIMS team for the idea, the invite, and for hosting and providing logistics for the call. Thanks to Liz and the Chicago Chapter for your involvement. I've already heard back from the LA members that they love hearing perspectives from other members around the country. I think and hope this is something that we can continue well after these COVID-19 calls. Thanks, Jeff, for your leadership and for so quickly partnering with other chapters to ensure we're bringing fresh ideas and discussions on COVID-19. Thanks to the LA chapter for putting together this week's panel, and thanks, Jeff, for moderating this week's panel. I'll give it back to you to introduce our distinguished panel. All right, providing their uh, professional insights this week will be Dan Aronson, uh, Managing Director and the U.S. Casualty Leader for Marsh uh, in New York. Again, thanks, Dan, for this, uh, your time and insight, especially with the last minute change to our panel. Uh, also joining us is Matt Rosenberg, President, President of Rosenberg and Parker, a surety broker out of Philadelphia. Uh, Whitney Craig, Director of Government Relations at RIMS at their home office in New York, and Vincent Monasterski, Vice President of Risk Management at Fox, and also an LA RIMS board member and past chapter president. So we'll get started with the questions now. Uh, again, thanks in advance to all the panelists for the time and willingness to share their thoughts in these unprecedented times. Whitney, we're going to start with you. Uh, last week on this call, we discussed the potential of a PREA, or Pandemic Risk and Insurance Act, similar to TRIA for terrorism exposures. I saw that RIMS on Monday sent a letter to Congress urging them to support the legislation. Can you give us some more information on this? And what can our membership do to support this initiative? Hi, Jeff and all. I just want to first thank you for having this call. I think this topic is extremely important and I think you guys should continue to have them, and I'm more than happy to join any other chapters if they need me to talk about these things, these things further. Yes, you're right. Last week, we sent a letter to Congress asking them to support more of the concept of PREA, which would be a backstop for pandemic risk insurance, similar to that of TRIA that many of you are familiar with. We are urging Congress to support this initiative based upon a survey that RIMS sent out to RIMS members um, throughout the country. We had over 90% of RIMS members vote to um, move this forward. Um, they were very passionate. I've received numerous phone calls, emails about this initiative, and we thought it was important that RIMS step up and make comments on this and urge Congress to move this forward. To help this move forward, um, we have set up a grassroots initiative. If you go to the rims.org slash advocacy slash coronavirus webpage, you can click on the link there and participate in our grassroots. And this essentially just sends a message to Congress that we want this initiative to stay top of mind. Um, we aren't right now supporting any specific bill. There have been a few bills that have been introduced either in discussion form or in actual legislation drop. And as of right now, we don't support either one of those bills um, as written. We are working with members of Congress. I have been on calls with the drafters of legislation and we're providing good insight for them and answering questions they may have on how this would work, given that risk managers are the ones who purchase insurance and they really know 
um, these issues and what would be the best looking forward initiative for pandemic risk? Whitney, besides uh, PREA, what, what are some other uh, federal or state initi initiatives related to the pandemic that risk managers should be aware of? Sure. On the federal side, Mike Thompson, he is a congressman from California. He introduced last week a bill that would compel insurers to cover business interruption um, for pandemics, for um, COVID-19. And this is something very similar to that in the states that we've seen, but it's interesting that he decided to do this because he's also one of the 32 members um, of the California delegation who sent a note to Commis Commissioner Lara asking him to use his authority to ensure that insurance companies comply with their business interruption policies. So, um, I don't see that bill gaining much traction in the Senate. And while it is bipartisan, there is one Republican member who has signed on as a co-sponsor to this bill. It doesn't seem to have much traction um, in the Senate, which it would need to in order to pass. So right now, it's, we're waiting to see what this is. But given that this is happening, I think it's important that you Continue to check with me for updates. Continue to check um, RIM sites for updates to see what new initiatives or legislations are coming out for COVID that could really hurt or help your businesses. That's interesting. Uh, I, I, I'm going to turn it over to Vinny from a risk management perspective. While insurers are likely to aggressively defend any effort at rewriting insurance policies to cover COVID-19 for business interruption, I don't think insurers are going to be able to sit on the sidelines and contribute nothing. But what, what do you think would be a reasonable contribution uh, and what might it look like? Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate also uh, being on this call. Um, well, I don't feel that straight exclusions would be reasonable um, or even worse, reverting to a named perils form. Um, instead, offering sublimits is one way to reduce exposure for the carriers and, and meet in the middle. I've also, I've already started to see this occurring in the marketplace. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan at this point. Uh, as a casualty broker, uh, I mean, what comments do you have about the possibility of having first party loss of revenue or business interruption covered under a general liability policy due to a company mitigating its liability exposures by shutting down? This has been something that has been thrown around by some uh, coverage councils. Torn on it. I, I want to make sure that, that there is coverage for insureds, uh, but my belief is it should be handled similar to terrorism or somehow where, where there's a joint government and insurance product for the pandemic. I think liability triggers have been based upon property damage, bodily injury, advertising, or personal injury for so many years now. And there's so much case law that focuses around these triggers that I think it would be very difficult to make a wholesale change here. And as a risk manager, I'm, I, I'll throw in my, my opinion on that also. I, I think you're, you're entering a slippery slope of uh, putting coverage where coverage wasn't initially thought to be uh, part of a policy or, or Put into the pricing, and uh, I, I think this is a new world for everyone, and uh, we'll we'll see where it goes. But uh, I, I'm going to turn it over to Vinny again. From a risk and insurance perspective, what are some of the issues that that your company Fox has faced as a result of the pandemic, and what steps have you taken uh, to address some of those challenges? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, well, from a risk standpoint, like most companies, Fox bears in the same issues. Uh, you know, for example, one of the biggest issues is how can we ensure the health and safety of our employees? Uh, you know, for example, take, uh, take our studio lot in Los Angeles. We have taken such steps as implemented string, stringent sanitation protocols, such as you know, installing touchless fixtures, air filtration, et cetera. We've implemented employee screening for essential staff. To maintain our broadcast operations, such as 
screening questions, temperature tests, and and limit you know in and out uh, in the buildings for the duration of the shift. Another way is uh, we made takeout only for our restaurants. We have three cafeterias um, on the lot, and we have uh, implemented delivery of box lunches to those essential staff so they can remain building and limit in and out. Uh, we've limited lot ingress and egress. Of course, reinforcing social distancing protocols, and and then there's some services that have slowed down. So, for example, food services. So we've repurposed our food service employees to cook and donate 2,000 meals per day for those in need in the Los Angeles community. And for example, our costume department staff has been making masks for fellow colleagues. Some of the issues specific to Fox are advertising, advertising driven from our programming, of course. Uh, news continues to exist, but sports programming becomes more of a concern. So one major step taken, including uh, implementing alternative product programming. For example, eSports in lieu of live events. We partnered with iHeart to have an iHeart Living Room Concert for America. And we've uh, hosted town halls on these COVID issues. Lastly, from, from an insurance perspective, again, I believe we're facing similar issues as most other companies. You know, changing of our exposures that affect liability, such as employees driving less, reduced operations and activity, and reduced interaction with third parties. As well as, and the increased, and just overall, the increased uncertainty the carriers are exper experiencing, placing added pressure to an already struggling market. Yeah, you, you have exposures that uh, span span the board and uh, uh, it sounds like you're doing a lot with the community while also taking care of your own internal um, exposures that you have. Uh, as your, what changes have you made to how you communicate with your insurance partners? Have you gone through a renewal yet? Uh, and, and what are some of the challenges that, that you see uh, either currently or going forward uh, as, as we continue with uh, some of the uh, uh, stay at home provisions and, and uh, other things that uh, may last for who knows uh, another year or so? Right. And I think, I think we all could say that we've all been very busy during this time. Uh, you know, Heading into uh, what I call pre-COVID, we were extremely busy as it is, and you know, entering our renewal period, and so that on top of uh, the COVID issues that we're all seeing, seeing has uh, we've been busier than ever. Um, but fortunately, you know, for our business, uh, is largely phone and email, so it can be done remotely. You know, I'm sure, like most, video conferencing has increased. For us, and and that helps with bringing back that necessary human element back to the business, uh, as opposed to meetings. So that has stepped up and has been very helpful. Uh, Dan, from a from a broker perspective, and, and you're seeing clients from across the country. Uh, what strategies can struggling insureds take as they prepare to meet with their underwriters during this time? Sure. So, so my, my hope is that insurers will act commercially and that the, the best course of action is, is really to be prepared to articulate any change in operations um, or changes in, in the financial outlook of the firm and, and really what does the current situation mean. Um, you know, the change in exposure and operations should be explained very specifically and there should always really be an ask of what's needed. So maybe a change in deductibles warranted. Maybe a company still needs to buy excess insurance, but they can't afford to remit payment up front. So share an approach that would work for the company. Um, there could be a government immunity or a shutdown in operations uh, that substantially reduces the exposure for the time being um, w w without an adjustable exposure agreement. Um, so the are down early on in the period and, and ramp up as the real exposure ramps up and, and cash at least now with an understanding that the, the company will be in a better position in the future. Really articulate the need and bring insurers under the tents because again, I really do feel like they are 
trying to be as commercial as possible, or at least we should make them be that way. Uh, I'm guessing you have many clients or insureds who are part of industries that have completely shut down as a result of this uh, pandemic. How does this affect the underwriting review with insurance carriers? And uh, on the same lines, has the credit review of insureds changed since the, since the onset of COVID-19? Sure. Uh, so so there, there's two considerations in my mind. Uh, one is ensuring that we provide notice of any material change in exposure so insurers aren't going to enact their material change in exposure clauses. Um, and, and also, so we would address any covered shortfalls. Second, how does the company's change in exposure impact the current program or the renewal in terms of structure, amount, when premiums are paid or impact to loss projections and, and how collateral uh, is funded or what the amount of the collateral will be? It, it really boils down to articulating both the change in quantitative as well as qualitative exposure. What I mean by that is quantitative is the numbers, the work comp payrolls, the revenues, number of vehicles, the mileage driven. Uh, owned versus non-owned vehicles could also be an example. The qualitative is really how is the operation changed? How is the employee base work changed? Uh, how is the product that is being created changed? Right, workers comp class codes, manual rating may change. That can impact taxes or the loss pick. People are working from home, so uh, you know a, a return to work program kind of is very easy in, in some instances right now. Um, change in how a company operates, right? So, so the restaurant example, uh, auto exposure might be down because they're, or I'm sorry, auto exposure is up because they're doing delivery, but slip and fall is down because no one's coming in, liquor liability is down, maybe third party discrimination is down. Um, or, or companies who might be responding to the pandemic with countermeasures, right? Starting to manufacture face masks or ventilators, uh, maybe their premises exposure is down. Uh, but they're, for, from a, a normal standpoint, they're going to be turned into a temporary hospital. And, and maybe all of this exposure or a lot of this exposure is going to fall under the PREP Act, which provides government immunity. It, it's not going to provide cover for everything, but it allows you to, to paint the picture differently to the insurers and, and hopefully get the impact you need. Um, you asked about the, the, the credit piece. I think insurers are concerned about the impact of the pandemic and how their portfolios are going to perform, right? They don't want credit risk. A lot of their focus as they review the, the portfolios is around the larger unsecured collateral amount risks, but also industries that are going to be most impacted. Um, we, we've seen some insurers ask for midterm discussions. We have seen some requests for additional collateral midterm. I think the biggest change is that many insurers are looking to support Support their existing insurers, but all of a sudden are being more conservative when looking at new opportunities, right? They're all going after new business for years, but, but they're, they're taking a harder stance on tough credit profiles uh, or those impacted by classes of business. The, the, the last thing I would say is that on the credit calls, there's more of a focus on short term in addition to the long term outlook of a company. What are the liquidity options? Uh, how has the company fared through? other challenging economic periods, and, and also how is the management team from an experience standpoint in shepherding that company or other companies through tough time? That, that's really what I'm seeing right now. For these credit calls, are, are you seeing different people getting involved now as a result of uh, new underwriting and everything else? I mean, are, 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 are the credit officers and, and insurance carriers uh, asking to uh, speak to the highest levels of the organization, and has this changed at all? So uh, I, I think carriers have always wanted to be seen as creditors, and they, they I, this is going to sound funny, but they, they, they want to be, they want the same respect that uh, companies give their bankers. So I, I think for, for larger credit risks, we've, we've always had um, exec teams involved in the credit discussions. It could be treasurer, CFOs, at times. Um, so to your point, I think painting the picture right now, however, that's best on it is really going to be what's important. So a CEO who says, I have done this before, the CFO who says, we have access to liquidity. Our banks are calling every day saying, how can we help? I think, I, I think um, the answer is yes. Some companies have done it in the past, but now it's, it can be more important than ever. However, best to tell that story. Great. Uh, when, what are some of the struggling companies' options 
that which still need insurance, uh, but also traditionally need to post collateral to ensure their ability to cover any self-insured or deductible programs. Those companies that are, are struggling right now, what, what are their options uh, beyond the traditional forms of collateral? Sure. So, so first and foremost, I think the blocking and tackling is pinpointing the exact liabilities that need to be collateralized. If exposures are down, if operations have changed, we need to articulate how that will impact the expected losses because the most important thing is to get that loss pick and the historic liabilities that the carrier is looking to collateralize to get that down to a more manageable number, to the right number. Um, if historic work comp claims have improved suddenly because people, uh, you know, can work from home or, or can do modified duty, right, in addition to the go forward. So start with the analyzation. Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe changing the structure would be helpful. Maybe guarantee costs, canceling and writing guarantee costs for a period of time while exposures are down and getting installments on that versus posting collateral. Maybe changing the deductible midterm to get a lower deductible to get lower collateral. The type of collateral um, obviously will, will, will be impactful, right? Can we use surety? Can we do a buy down and defer additional collateral? Um, break the letter of credit up into installments. I know they don't love doing that, but but if that will help the company. Um, the other thing I like to do is for a company that where liquidity and capital truly are an issue, I like to work out a 12 month deal or at renewal, but start with a three or six month policy that will then be extended up to 12 months. This lowers the initial collateral needs significantly because the carrier is not on the hook for the full year, day one. So um, those are some things I think people should really look at in addition to the credit call discussions. Now, those are great ideas, some, some I haven't heard yet, so I appreciate those comments. Uh, you did bring up surety bonds, and we have president of uh, Rosenberg and Parker, large surety broker on the line. So, Matt, uh, can surety bonds help in any of the credit collateral issues that insureds are faced with, and have you helped out clients at this point? Uh, Jeff, thank you for the question. I first, like Whitney, would like to thank you for Thank the LA, DFW, and Chicago RIMS chapters for inviting me here and uh, for this timely discussion. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, as it pertains to the question regarding uh, credit collateral issues uh, for, uh, for our clients, and um, the answer is uh, we are seeing an uptick in inquiries from clients um, asking us about using their surety facilities to replace their letters of credit. Um, and it can be favored over the letter of credit um, because, you know, it, it will preserve their uh, lines of credit, which obviously are, are precious right now. Um, and sometimes, many times, we see them enjoy lower costs um, that a surety bond can provide, a surety bond can provide over an LC. And we have been doing it for years. You mentioned uh, a work comp obligation uh, for self-insured work comp obligations to the state. Uh, we sometimes mandated that you have to that a bond's required, and sometimes you have a choice between a letter of credit or a bond. Um, and then we, uh, in recent times, we've also, I'd say recent times, particularly in the last five years, some of the larger uh, surety writers um, like Travelers, Zurich, Chubb, are replacing uh, letters of credit with bonds for the, um, for the insurance premium bonds and the retro bonds. Um, they're a little bit tougher if you're not in A credit, um, to come by, but um, but they are they can be available for those companies trying to preserve their their letter of credit. And we're also seeing as credit rating agencies drop certain companies below investment grade, that their parental guarantee is not acceptable for certain obligations where they previously were. And we're seeing inquiries as they decide whether they want to use a letter of credit or a bond. Um, and it really just depends on. Uh, on the client in their, their industry, their credit quality, as far as whether uh, a surety is um, able to extend credit uh, to that client. But we certainly are having a lot more discussions now uh, in the last 30 to 40 days. Yeah, has the underwriting uh, criteria changed uh, in the last 30, 45 days, like you said? Uh, and what are surety providers doing different than maybe they did two months ago? Um, yeah, the, um, 
I would say that's it's a little bit of a loaded question, of course, and these are uncertain times, but the, um, the surety companies, many of them are, are staying the course and they are, um, they're, they're watching their clients more than they have before. I think quite frankly, some of them have more time to do it because they're not commuting and traveling. Um, and, uh, and, and then there's some sureties in our opinion that are running a little more scared, a little more concerned, those conservative underwriters that um, see credit rating drops and um, they wanna get on some calls, they wanna talk to risk management, they wanna talk to treasury, which we think is a good idea. But we are seeing a, a little bit more um, unease from certain markets that they, they need to be, um, risk managers really need to speak to them with their brokers. And has there been any other effects uh, beyond the underwriting side on the surety industry uh, at this point? Uh, the industry uh, on the whole is, is doing well. That being said, interestingly, the industry, the surety industry was downgraded. Um, and um, I didn't, a lot of us didn't know that really could be done as an industry. I think that was done because of the concerns of the obligations that they have. Um, that being said, surety is written um, almost exclusively, except with, with a few exceptions by the large insurance carriers. So um, we expect that all of the large insurance carriers, um, like the Chubbs, the Travelers, Arch, Hartford, Liberty, um, you name it, Chubb, um, and many more, will be able to pay any of their obligations. So there isn't really a concern that, um, that the surety companies uh, won't be around to, to do that. Um, you, know, you, know, you do want to look at AM Best. Um, AM Best rates, of course, all the insurance companies. And if you're not rated A minus or better, you're effectively not in the surety business. So those sureties that are rated A minus, um, we certainly would want to watch to make sure they don't drop below that rating. Thanks for that info. I'm going to turn it back over to Whitney and then I'll follow up with Vinny uh, talking about uh, uh, California and the Department of Insurance has just uh, recently issued a mandate for insurers to refund premiums from some lines of cover based on the current stay at home mandates, uh, which have significantly reduced risk and exposure. Uh, I've also seen State Farm and farmers proactively advertise that they'll be issuing refunds for the same reason. Uh, is this premium refund approach sufficient? Uh, one question, and then also for Whitney, uh, are you seeing this in other states beyond California? Um, do you want Vinny to ask, answer the efficient question first, and then I can answer the state question? Sure, we'll, we'll, we'll go with Vinny. Do you think that's sufficient, and uh, what, what's your thoughts on, uh, on this new mandate? Yes, thank you. Um, I feel it is, uh, you know, premiums are driven by several factors, uh, exposures being a big one. I mean, if people are driving less, interacting with, interacting with the public less, working less, then premiums should be reflective of that in the form of either credits or return premium uh, for most lines of coverage, especially in auto, uh, auto liability, you know, GL and work comp. I mean, simply put, a lower exposure should reflect a you know, lower premium. And, and Whitney, so, so this was a California initi initiative that, that I'm aware of. Are you seeing this in other states or from our federal level? Um, I'm not, but I'm also seeing other states um, try to tackle the business interruption issue. There are about six states with legislation right now compelling insurers to cover BI for COVID-19. So I think because California hasn't gone that route yet. I think they're trying to help consumers by um, going this route, which is somewhat of an easier route, given that insurers, for the most part, were doing something like this anyway. Um, I know I received an email from USAA saying they were refunding me some of my premiums. So I think they're more so just pressuring their insurance companies to do the right thing during this time. Um, I think it's something that we do need to watch on the BI side, given that um, it's, the insurers, you know, don't want this right now, and some of the contractual um, 
issues that could come about in terms of litigation and things like that. I think it's all going to be really interesting to see what actually passes. Um, I do think that some of the bills that have been introduced, again, don't have much traction, um, but I think it's more of the legislators trying to gain a little bit more favor from their um, voters, given that it's an election year. So I think given that we have six states now, I do see many more states doing things like this um, down the road. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan, uh, I'll, I'll ask you a similar question. I mean, the premium refunds are nice uh, from a uh, uh, insured point of view where our exposures are less, but uh, uh, I've heard that some companies are looking to defer premium payments during this time. Uh, and how do insurers look at this and what are some of the pros and cons of deferring premiums, especially if you are a struggling company that uh, is trying to conserve as much revenue as possible during the next few months? Sure, and, and I, my answer, I'd like to start maybe with a little bit of an answer to the last question as I roll into this one, because I think in the commercial space, it's very different than the personal lines. On personal lines, you can give a certain percentage across the board. My fear on commercial and having states weigh in here is, you know, I personally have insureds who actually have exposure bases that are up significantly because they're benefiting from this time with deliveries uh, or, or, or grocery stores that, that are selling out every day. But most of my insureds, they're not just down 2%, 5%, 10% exposures. I have some that are completely shut down, some that are shut down 50% of the way, some are down 80%. Whatever the states come up with is really not going to be as material for them, I don't believe, as what we should negotiate on behalf of that insured. So I really think it should be very specific to insureds and what is appropriate for them and what is fair. And, and again, you know, as I said before, insurers should act commercially. So as this deals with deferred premium, whatever that right premium is, um, you know, the, they should, they really should give in based on whether or not the current premium or collateral is too high for change in exposures, or simply insureds can't fund the current installment schedule. So it never, it really doesn't hurt to ask, assuming the request is backed by constructive reasoning and, and examples of what's going on with the firm. I, I would say the only con could be um, internally, just make sure no one is surprised by a larger premium payment that may be due in the future, right? So you, you never want the surprise in the budget. But, I, but I, I think a few ways to approach this. One, changing the overall premium to be collected by lowering the minimum and deposit amount. Two, looking to change the rate midterm if the carrier's filings will allow it. Um, or three, changing that installment plan to defer installments. Maybe it's based on lower premium, maybe it's on the collateral, uh, many insurers and state bulletins have already supported deferral of installments or they put a moratorium on cancellation of non-payment. Um, but again, I think it's really crucial to take every situation and really be fair to the insured and, and present the case to the carriers who hopefully will be commercial. And are you seeing that many, most insurers are amenable to uh, working, it, working it out with their insureds? Um, I, I wouldn't say most. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of this is still ongoing. We, we, we have multiple situations that have turned into very positive stories uh, where the carriers have worked with the insureds. We have other instances where uh, there, there's two things that can hold up the process. One is the carriers are saying, we actually have filed plans and we have to see how we could even be compliant with doing something midterm. Um, the second is whereby they're, they're concerned on some maybe more challenging risks where they're saying we wouldn't have written this policy if it wasn't for a minimum amount of premium. And even though you're shut down for these three months, you were open three months before in the beginning of the policy, you expect to be open again in another four months. And, and there always is potential for catastrophic exposure on your risk. So that's where we're getting a lot of the pushback where they feel they needed a certain amount of premium just to even right the risk in the first place. Okay, thanks. Uh, Matt, are surety providers doing anything different uh, as a result of uh, many businesses either shutting down or others facing insolvency or bankruptcy uh, as a result of this pandemic? 
Uh, Jeff, that's a, it's a great question because um, you would think that there would be a great deal of concern from the sureties uh, for risks that they're on, that they are concerned that there's a, a bankruptcy in the future. Sureties certainly write coal companies. They're in the oil and gas business. They're in retail. They're in all the big industries that are of concern and um, and companies that, that they're concerned about. But it, they also experienced 2000 and 2008, 2009 recessions and, and fared well through them. Um, chapter 11 reorganization bankruptcy isn't as concerning to a surety because the uh, uh, companies need the bonds. Um, the premium is paid. It can be paid in bankruptcy court. Chapter seven, of course, is, is when you're dissolving a company, that's uh, more of a concern for a surety. Um, and then um, the sureties are looking at the types of bonds they're writing uh, because there's so many types of commercial surety bonds out there and some are, are much more risky than others. So they're, they're trying to protect those that are uh, more of, like we mentioned earlier, ones that are replacing letters of credit, um, any kind of advance payment, any kind of um, any kind of bond that is more of an, an on-demand guarantee. Um, so they are looking. They they do oftentimes, most of the times, have rights in their indemnity agreement to call on collateral, um, and some are exercising that. They're trying to work with the clients, maybe not asking for a hundred percent. Um, or they're beginning discussions of it. They might say, all right, we're in uncharted territory. We don't know. We all don't know how long this is going to go for, how rocky it is going to be for your company or your industry or both. Um, so they may take a little bit of a wait and see, but just start the dialogue. Um, they're also cons they're looking at rate increases as companies, um, their um, S&P and Moody's downgrade certain companies. They don't qualify for the rates that maybe they previously had. Sureties file their rates with each and every state, and um, they file different rates, and the rates are based usually and almost exclusively off of the credit quality. So if the credit quality declines, then rates would increase. And it doesn't happen often in our industry, but in this time we are seeing we're seeing some of that. And lastly, the um, uh, the indemnity agreement we mentioned I mentioned, they're looking to sometimes improve their indemnity agreements. We've over the last this unprecedented. Uh, economy that's been great for so long. Um, the sureties were willing to take indemnity agreements that maybe weren't as strong uh, for them. And now they're looking to go back to the client and renegotiate those indemnity agreements. So it definitely takes some work with legal and um, your broker and, um, and you to, to, to work through those. Turning it around the other way, What's your opinion on will will all sureties survive this pandemic? Are, are there surety companies that could be in trouble with the type of bonds that they may have written in the past and the industries that they're in that they may not survive? Yeah, I, I obviously I don't have a crystal ball, um, and we don't know how long uh, this is going to last. But uh, I would say again because um, you know we're, everyone on this call pretty much works with the big insurance companies that write surety, like I had mentioned before. And um, I believe, but there are other companies, by the way, I guess I'll say as a side note, that aren't household names, um, that aren't Liberty and Travelers and Chubb and CNA and Zurich, those are the top five sureties and others that aren't household names. So um, maybe if, if a company is with a surety company that is a lesser known quantity, is a monoline surety has, as I mentioned earlier, a, a low a, a credit rating, either AM, their AM best rating of A minus, um, and, and is concerned of dropping or, um, or you know, obviously watching the, their S and P and Moody's ratings. But the short answer is, I, I think they'll be okay. I have one final question, kind of on the surety side. Uh, are there new provisions or terms in surety bonds that our members and, and listeners this call should be aware of? Yeah, that that question is interesting to me because I normally would say no. It's most surety bonds are, um, are are standard for the most part. Although we do manuscript different bond forms for different obligations, uh, but but many bonds follow a contract. So if if there's a contract. Um, a government contract or 
some contract with an obligee that a client has, um, we have to look at the contract too. And what we're now seeing starting for the first time is pandemic exclusions on the bond uh, in the damages section, or I'm sorry, on the contract in the damages section. And they're stating that uh, they will not cover um, allow delays or they won't allow um, for any monetary damages because of the pandemic. And normally you would have some sort of force majeure that would uh, allow for those kinds of things. So sureties are, are mindful of that. Um, and it, it could be harder for some companies to get bonds if those um, exclusions are in there. Now, sometimes it could be negotiated out, but we now have to be mindful uh, that um, some lawyers are going to be in there trying to create some pandemic exclusions that are going to affect the bond. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, turning it back over to Vinny, uh, have any of the changes that you've had to make made you rethink about how you did things in the past? In other words, are there some positive things that will come from this pandemic? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll answer from kind of just a general general view, both uh, whether it's personal and business, but um, from, from a general standpoint, you know, better hygiene and awareness. Um, I think one of the positives that will come of this is that people and business, people and businesses will take more seriously the importance of basic hygiene, such as you know, proper hand washing. Uh, you know, and another, another area is self-isolating. You know, that can be you know, used in after this with regards to staying home from work if you're not feeling well or sick. I think we've all experienced this when someone is getting a cold or a flu is running through the office because people are coming in and they're sick. And so if self-isolating is a perfect solution for that, um, as, as such, it could increase productivity throughout your business. Um, and then just an overall general focus on just building up our immune systems, I think is another way to, uh, to really just as, as a risk manager to try to be proactive as opposed to reactive. Thanks, uh, Dan, I'll throw this to you. While we may, may never get back to what was considered normal, what do you believe will be some of the major changes in how insurance is purchased going forward? So, yeah, for, first, I think, uh, unfortunately, changes in coverage may be inevitable. Uh, you know, whether that's exclusions on li liability policies for certain classes of business, uh, you know, obviously we should negotiate exclusions off uh, or try to make the language less broad. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the former. Um, you know, in workers' compensation, that, that could take a different form around communicable disease. I think it's going to be much tougher to purchase uh, communicable disease coverage subject to a single event retention. Currently, some self-insured excess comp forms allow for that, one, one retention to be applied. I think in deductible policies, for the most part, unless you had an aggregate on your deductible for disease, um, it often already was a deductible per claimant for, for uh, any disease application. I, I think for, there could be sublimiting, such as on communicable disease, uh, on the work comp, on liability, it could be subject to pandemic or virus sublimits um, if, if there is cover. I, I think second, the biggest, uh, the, the big lesson is, is that we've learned is the exposure bases are volatile uh, in the future, right? If this should happen again. So maybe there'll be adjustability of premiums with lower minimums or, or some sort of rateability uh, on excess policies, which ha have really basically been flat for years um, or, or rating bases um, that might have been flat or composite rating. Like AL, uh, on auto, we, we've always seen it as like a flat rate per vehicle. Maybe maybe more people will do it for, on, a, on a mileage basis versus a vehicle count. Um, Midterm audit features, right? To maybe you go in with lower, you know, expectations on exposure bases and then you adjust for it throughout the year, kind of like PEOs handle it. The third thing I think will change is how premiums are paid, and, and maybe it's more favorable payment terms uh, for policies that have normally been due and payable at inception, like umbrella excess, or uh, my thought is maybe installments that, that might match a company's cash flow or busy periods um, better than what we've done in the past where carriers just said, I want 10 equals, right, or a certain amount down and eight equals. 
So th those are some of the changes I think could, could take place in the future. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Vinny, do you, do you have concerns for the future with regard to uh, your insurance programs as a result of how claims and government, governmental actions have come through for this pandemic? Um, absolutely. I mean, you know, just simply put, I mean, you know, we, we already had a, we're already experiencing a hardening uh, market prior to this. So, uh, you know, with, with COVID kind of um, overlaying on top of this, I fear insurers will, you know, we'll use this whether justified or not, you know, as a reason to increase rates even higher. Um, so that's just always, always a concern. We're trying to get ahead of it as risk managers and uh, this is just another layer that is complicating our, our jobs. This question is going to, I'm going to kind of pose it to each, but I'll start with Whitney. Uh, as risk managers, many of us would like to take advantage of some of these government government mandated coverage from insurers or premium refunds. Uh, but do you see issues with the government legislating insurers to pay claims on policies coverage that uh, no one really expected or had expected exposure from or expected to pay claims from? Uh, is there, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a slippery slope of mandating coverage now versus how insurers may exclude losses in the future? Right, I, I think it's a very slippery slope. Um, and I think once we do things like this, it's very hard to come back from. That's why PREA, what we um, supported is proactive. Um, it's forward looking. I've heard of the government looking at other ways to compensate businesses, especially small businesses during this crisis, and that's with a compensation fund similar to that of the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. So I think if the government wants to step in, I think there are surely other ways that they can do it without the, um, you know, the contract clause <laughs> um, considerations that legislating these types of things could eventually um, make happen. So I think it's important that we continue to push for a forward-looking solution because if we legislate this now, what happens in the future when or if this comes back again? So I think it's very important that while it could benefit us now in the long run, that we look toward um, real solutions that could help us all um, for years to come. Thanks, Dan. You answered this a little bit earlier, but uh, what, what's what's? Do you have any additional thoughts on, uh, on on that topic of government mandated uh, how insurance policies are supposed to work? Yeah. So, so <laughs> first and foremost, I am a broker, which means I'm a client advocate, um, and and I'll, I'll put that caveat, and I will do whatever is best for my for my insurance. But legislative direction to, to pay claims is concerning to me. You know, the way I've always handled business, I'm a big proponent in, in two things when it comes to claims. One, what was the intent of coverage? And two, when the intent isn't there, uh, ex gratia payments, right, whenever possible, based on business decisions or, or said another way, you know, pressuring insurers based on relationship and, and, and whatever else we can, we can do to get them to agree to make payments. Legislation requiring insurers to pay outside of intent or that relationship, I think, will have a backlash. It could be in terms of limits available, coverage and exclusionary language in the future, uh, or, or, or even the cost and premium uh, in, in the future. I, I also think it could impact the viability of insurers to pay claims that, that we're not talking about, right, the non-government COVID-related claims. Insureds paid good money for coverage of their core business risks. And that's what I'm concerned that would be compromised by some carriers having financial viability issues or really pushing back on everything possible because uh, they took such a hit to, to their earnings. Um, but, but I'm just going to end with, again, first and foremost, I will back up my, my client uh, for whatever they need. And we appreciate that. Uh, Vinny, I'll ask you the same question from a risk manager perspective. What's, what's your thought on this? Uh, yeah, thank you. And even though I'm a client, uh, I agree with uh, Whitney and Dan on this as well. I mean, I definitely, definitely feel it's a slippery slope. I mean, insurance, 
you know, is, is a business as well uh, that's being affected just like many other businesses and forcing insurers to pay for something that they contractually would not have otherwise is not the proper message in my opinion. Uh, you know, like any contract, there are both sides and me, you know, the client insured, you know, has agreed to those terms by you know, actually purchasing that, that policy. I'll be, you know, unable to redline it, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, we have options and, um, and, you know, can negotiate in certain areas, but uh, I definitely think it could be. Great. I appreciate uh, everyone's feedback. I, I just have one fellow or one final question to Vinny. Uh, as a fellow risk manager, I know you're getting inundated with emails about webinars like this one. And again, we appreciate uh, the 400 or so people who uh, who registered for this. Uh, but how do you decide which ones to participate in, especially in the world where things answers seem to be changing daily? Absolutely, and I'll prep before I answer the question, I'll also state that I appreciate everyone taking their time to be on this call, you know, because there's a lot of content out there on this subject. Uh, you know, you could spend all all of your day attending webinars, and reading articles on this subject. You know, personally, I, I attend and read where I can, uh, but you know, because we have a team, a department, uh, what I like to do is. Um, you know, have either one or two staff members maybe attend a webinar, read an article, share an article, and then kind of report back to the group. So this allows us to kind of cast a wider net of, of what's out there and, and get what's important and report back to the department, you know, without, you know, taxing the, in, the entire department um, and using our resources. Great. Well, Again, uh, th these calls, which are going to be weekly calls, are for risk professionals by risk professionals, which is the tagline we're using. So it's uh, what risk managers want to hear and uh, who they want to hear it from. Uh, but that will wrap up this week's call. I want to thank all the RIMS members from the Chicago, Dallas, and LA chapters for listening, along with all of our friends from around the country. A special thank you to our panelists today, uh, Whitney, Vincent, Dan, and Matt. Uh, we look forward to our members' feedback and questions that we can address on future calls. Uh, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Jonathan for a few final comments. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. And uh, what an amazing call this week. Thanks to all of our panelists for, for jumping on and providing such timely insight. As we mentioned last week, before we close out our call, I want to remind you that our role as risk managers doesn't end at the workplace. And if you know of a neighbor or friend who might be a victim of domestic abuse, Please text the word LOVE IS to 22522, and this will connect you to someone with the National Domestic Violence Hotline. And if you know of a child that might be abused during this time, please call 1-800-4-A-CHILD. That's 1-800-422-4453. Shelter-in-place orders for those impacted by domestic violence can be an even more haunting time for those individuals. Thanks again for joining. Our next call is the 30th of April at the same time. Our registration will open next Monday. We look forward to having you on the call. Stay safe, and we'll talk next week.